Dirty Birds, what's up? And welcome to another edition of Falcon's Final Whistle presented by Zaxby's. I'm your host, Will McFadden. I'm joined by Tori McElhaney and Taryn Walk. And we are down here in Miami for joint practices. The Falcons and the Dolphins shared the field for the very first one today. And it was a lot of fun. Honestly, mm-hmm. the, the fans were there. There was really good energy, um, I think, out there for uh, the session. Taryn, we'll, we'll start with you. What was kind of like big picture observation from the first joint practice today. Put some respect on Fort Lauderdale, please. <laughs> we are in Fort Lauderdale. We are in well, Fort Lauderdale. Well, technically Miami Gardens is where the stadium and practice facility is. In this moment right now. We're, we're in, in South in, Florida. <laughs> South Florida. I'll settle with that. We are outside 305. We are latitude 436 <laughs> and longitude. I don't even know what I the latitudes and longitudes mm-hmm. are. I was I was ready for you. Like, I was going to let you go with that. Yeah, that's my brand, honestly, is just being able to know stuff like that. I've cultivated a very (laughs) specific brand where people wouldn't be shocked by that. They're in degrees. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Just like the amount of degrees was way too many today. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. But. (laughs) Nice, nice segue, Taryn. It was very hot. It was so hot. It was not as bad as last year, though. Having been here last year, last year was way worse. We at least got, like, cloud coverage and a breeze. Mm -hmm. Today, last year, there was none of that. Will got to sit in the stands while Tori and I were sweating. Yeah, it was great in the stands. Yeah. <laughs> it was lovely. Tori and I, we, because of like it being joint practices, the Falcons offense paired up with the Falcons defense. The Falcons defense. Nope. No. The Falcons. I'm sun drained. <laughs> yeah. Falcons 1v1s. Offense, yep. Dolphins defense. Falcons defense. Dolphins offense. offense. Yep, you got it. Special teams, I don't know where they were. But <laughs> <laughs> probably together somewhere. And so I was over with the Falcons offense and the Dolphins defense. Tori was with the opposite of those two. And so we were like right in the end zone. And I'm pretty sure I looked over and you were the only one in that corner. And then I was the only one in my corner and everyone else was in the stands. We were yeah. in the shade. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if Tori was breaking some rules, but given Probably. the fact that y'all were the only two literally mm-hmm. just standing on the field, yeah. as you said, I'm pretty sure the rules went out the window when a, the media went to the stands. I was right next to security. I followed them. Here's the thing. I am prone to ask for forgiveness, not permission. Should we admit to this appreci- on air? Yes, we okay. should because I appreciate the heck out of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good life advice. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So Anyways. what what don't fans know about what happened today, Tori? What is the, the main thing they need to know? I think that the physicality went up. I think we talked about like the physicality from the first week of no pads to the second week with pads. Mm-hmm. The intensity, the physicality obviously goes up. But the physicality and intensity from padded practice to now going against someone who is not your teammate – I think just cranks it up a little bit more, a couple more notches. And I think we saw that today. I really, you talked about the energy. I thought the energy was, was good. And something else too is like, it wasn't a perfect practice. It very much showed kind of how far the Falcons still need to go, what they're having a, more of a clarity of what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Cause you're going against, you have this, almost like a, a measuring stick Yes, and, and to kind of see where they stack up. And I, I think that was really, really good. As Taryn spoke on, I was with the Falcons defense. She was with the offense. And we'll get into kind of breaking down what we saw from each unit. But I was, I mean, I just know for me personally, y'all know how I feel about joint practices. Mm-hmm. This is the time, these two practices to me are the absolute crux of, the training camp preseason, more than preseason games for me, more than just a normal like training camp practice. These joint practices is what tells me the most about where guys are and how much further they need to go to get to week one. And we're, you know, we only had one practice and we have another another one tomorrow, but I feel really good about, I think, understanding more about what this team could be and what it could look like. So when you said it, it was a little, it wasn't like the cleanest practice. I totally understand what you mean by that. But the last time we spoke was after the Mercedes-Benz Stadium open practice on Friday. And I I feel like our takeaway from that practice was that it was pretty balanced, Mm -hmm. you know, and and a different way of reading that could be that there were mistakes by the offense. There were mistakes by the defense that either of the other sides were able to capitalize on. The difference here is that it's not the Falcons capitalizing one way or the other. So how much of this do you think is just a, 
a product of joint practices by necessity. The other team is out there working hard trying to get their place too versus actual real maybe issues that the Falcons need to... And issues is a strong word, but like, Taryn, you had Kirk Cousins kind of passing numbers mm-hmm. and you made a great note in your camp report about how throughout training camp, he's been pretty locked in. I mean, I think that's mm-hmm. been... For me, at least, like the main takeaway right. of training camp is like Kirk Cousins just looks like he's ready to go. And today, that wasn't necessarily the case. So, so again, like Tori, what, what do you think was kind of the, what do you put that on? The Dolphins or just a down day for the Falcons? I actually don't necessarily think that it's either of those things. Um, okay. I, I think that this is a byproduct of the game. And it's a byproduct of the Falcons trying to figure out who they are, what they do best, how personnel is going to look, how, what plays they're running, what's scripted, what's not scripted, what they're trying to work on. I, I think that it's less about, oh, maybe there were too many mistakes. Or, but really and truly, I don't. I, I try not to look at, at it that way. Yeah, and there weren't uh, – It wasn't mistakes like – Mistakes are yeah. is the wrong way to – It's just like, wins. It's the other team, exactly. you know, won some. I yeah. feel I feel like I'm maybe even not articulating this correctly to, to where I'm – I'm not saying that it was a bad practice at all. And I'm not saying that there were more mistakes than there were wins or whatever right. the case may be. It's just – it was very obvious to me that they were – Challenged? We're, yeah, they were challenged in a way that we haven't yeah. seen yet. That's By a, real, a playoff team. Right. By a playoff yeah. team from last year. No, mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, even in the one-on-ones, it's not like it was skewed one way drastically right. over another. I walked away thinking the Dolphins had the edge. Um, the way I took notes and whatnot, it showed that like the Dolphins had – the Falcons had two more incompletions than the Dolphins did to make it like as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. And it just felt different than what we have been seeing. But I think because the introduction of – Somebody who's actually like, I don't want you to get this. Like, <laughs> yeah. your demise is yeah. my success. And whereas, like, it's not that the Falcons defense hasn't been competitive in practice. Mm-hmm. It's just naturally different. Yeah. Like, you're more competitive against those who aren't in your team colors. Yeah. Should we talk a little bit more about one-on-ones? Because yes. I, it, was my fa- it was one of my favorite parts of practice. And as what we said, Taryn was with the offense. Yeah, I was so with the we'll defense. S- we'll start defense, you I guess, start- and then we'll go, we'll go offense. Okay, great. I, what's interesting is that you're saying this about, you know, Miami's offense. You felt like... I know you felt opposite. I felt completely... we met I, up at yeah. the halfway, and we're like... <laughs> Atlanta's right, defense dude, looked good. I think the Dolphins were <laughs> dominant in that compared to the Falcons. You're like, oh my gosh, I think opposite. Yeah. I don't know why I gave you an accent. <laughs> I like, do have one. <laughs> but, like, not that kind. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, more valley than yeah, my vocal deep, fry. Yeah, my deep... Uh, yeah, I do have vocal fry. And then my deep southern yeah. accent. Yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry to everybody. Jesus. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> that's awful. So, defense. I was very pleased with what I saw in one-on-ones Same. with this defense. I thought that they, in terms of just, like, sticky coverage, man, they were not making anything easy sticky, today. Sticky, icky, icky. Sticky coverage. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I think they really rode the line of between sticky coverage versus – you're holding or a pass interference. There were a couple times where I was like, just let them play because I want to see how far they can push it. And they did. They were, I mean, it was, it was very competitive. It was very physical, which I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I thought there were two names specifically that stood out to me. And the first one was Clark Phillips. I, I thought Clark Phillips, and I mentioned this in the camp report, Clark Phillips to me, I find him to be so fascinating because he to me is at his best when the lights are on and he's in these one-on-one situations and there's like pressure mounting mm-hmm. that he almost like goes into a different head. I mean, space. think of his first start last year, right? Like it, I can't remember exactly who it came against, but it was a was it tough Saints? situation. It was on the road. I, I believe. Was it the Saints? And I can't remember. I, I want to say it was like an NFC North team. Oh, okay. Um, but Tampa. 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 Okay. Totally wrong. His first start was Tampa Bay. What was game two? What was the second start? Carolina. Wow. Okay. So just I, NFC I thought South it team. was an NFC South. I team. was thinking it was like Green Bay or something. But I, anyway, Green Bay was week two. He did play. Okay. Um, but that was yeah. That was before he became a starter. Mm-hmm. But but basically, like he he started out of the gates really well yeah. last year. It, yeah. it thrust into that role. So that goes along exactly with, yeah. with your philosophy that he's like a good pressure moment 
player. Yeah, which is what you want kind of in that role. Yep. You need these corners to be fearless to a certain extent because of the nature of them being on an island and kind of there – it is a pressure situation that I don't think every single yeah. – it's very different than I think a lot of other positions in the singularity of it. You have to be able to lose without losing your confidence. Yes. And that is a hard thing, I think, to do. Right. That and, that, and that is Thank something you. that I think it's really interesting, and we'll get into this later, but that Mike Hughes, we saw that from moment to moment today. He got Tyreek Hill just zoomed past him for a 40-yard touchdown during 11-on-11s. The next series of 11-on-11s when they flip the field – Mike Hughes intercepts to attack a Like yep. it, it, it was one side of the same exact coin. A moment that you're just like, dang, that sucked. And then the next moment, you're kind of on top of the world. It's a big, playing corner in the league or honestly at any level, mm-hmm. that's what that is. It's a high, it's very high highs, very low lows. Uh, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about one on one. But that's, that's also the real quick to that exact point, though. I feel like that's almost what separates Mike Hughes and Clark Phillips at this. It's just that. It's purely kind of that veteran ability that I think Mike Hughes has shown to just like totally erase everything mm-hmm. from your memory, play in and play out. And mm-hmm. today was a great example of that. But, but Clark, Clark feels almost like being locked in is his superpower. Yeah. So it's such a weird discrepancy between those two guys where it's, it's almost like your typical corner and, and just erase it and go. And like, let's, let's go. And Clark Phillips, I have to say, I mean, he had an interception – just in the front of the end zone during one-on-ones that was just putting your body on the line, just making a play. And then he had a really, really nice pass breakup then his next time up in one-on-ones that I, I was like, that's what you want. That was perfect technique. He was exactly where he needed to be, got his hand on the ball, batted it down. You couldn't have drawn it up any better. Mm-hmm. So he had a really good one-on-one session. And then Anthony Johnson – who is not someone who I think we've talked a lot about, but he had a really, really good one-on-one session. He he also had an interception. He also had a PBU that I really enjoyed. I I thoroughly enjoyed watching him. And he's somebody that is actually, he's a bit of a bigger body type. Sometimes I'm watching him and I'm like, he could be a linebacker. Because I know on the, like, his height, weight, He's only, I mean, looking at it right now. He's a classic, like, Dan Quinn corner. He's 6'2", 205. Boom. Like, on the money. I truly, looking at him, I'm like, oh, he's a he's a linebacker. But then seeing his speed, you're like, ah, oh, no, it makes sense. But he, he was talking about physical. You want, like, a physical corner. You want somebody who's going to get up in some space. Like, that. that's what he did today in that one-on-one session. I really liked what I saw from him, too. Yeah. Um, Taryn, you know, I... I we're going to get to Atlanta's offense here in one second, but at least when it came to Atlanta's defense against Miami's offense, I kind of think, and you know, let me know if you agree with this, but Tyree Kill against AJ Terrell, like that was the matchup, right? There were a lot of matchups that I was looking for for that. Like when Tori and I did meet in between, after one on ones and like who had the advantage, I was honestly kind of shocked that she was like, I mean, the Falcons did great. Like, because you hear all this rah-rah about the Dolphins wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, Here's the thing, though. Tyreek Hill still did what Tyreek Hill does. Yeah. And he show- that's exactly what he showed. Yeah. I, I mean, I think watching Tyreek Hill against AJ, like, AJ was in position, but, like, Tyreek Hill is just one of the very, like, he was voted the number one player, I think, in the NFL Top 100. So, like, that's the level of competition we're talking about. But on the flip side, like Atlanta has done a lot of work on their offense and mm-hmm. in particular their receiving group. And the Dolphins have a pretty decent secondary. You know, right. like uh, I really love a lot of their players, Jalen Ramsey included. Mm-hmm. What did He's you see? Advertised. What did you see from, from Atlanta's offense against Miami's defense? I didn't necessarily realize it in the moment because I was just trying to keep up with every single matchup that went by. But Jalen Ramsey wasn't in the one on ones, which would have been interesting to have seen. Mm. Interesting. Um, Unless I just completely missed his number in these 24 reps. I feel I, like you would have heard I him. think I would have <laughs> <laughs> true. at least caught that number once. But So that was something that hit later that I thought was odd. But you definitely noticed him in the team play. Um, we've been talking so much about Kirk Cousins' consistency. His first series was the opposite. He In one-on-ones? Yeah. Like the first period of like team one-on-one. No, 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 not one-on-one. Um, team. 11 on like, 11. Yeah, 11 on 11 team drills and whatnot because he dropped a snap, 
And then that's when Calais Campbell got to him. We were like, oh, Calais is back. Aww, but Calais. on the wrong side. Yeah. It was um, great seeing Calais today. It was today. really good to see Calais yeah. Campbell again. Still massive. Yeah. For those who were worried. But then he had three incompletions in that series too. And that's when you saw Jalen Ramsey. He was in coverage for Kirk Cousins' pass to Darnell Mooney that was broken up. And then he got a hand on Kirk Cousins' pass to Raven Cloud later. The other one was just a pass to Kyle Pitts, but the pass was just off. Mm -hmm. So to see three incompletions in a series, I was like, we haven't seen this this entire camp. Mm -hmm. Was it one of those things that he got fired up a bit more as camp went, or as the day went? He got better. Because that's that to me is like, okay, first series out there. It's still abnormal from what we've seen, though. Right. And I understand it's a different defense, but we've talked so much about his consistency that one would have hoped slash liked to have seen it carry over into Miami. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but I, I think even in that, I don't think it's anything to be cause for concern that he went 0 of 3 in one 11 on 11 period. Yeah. Right. And, it's just right. a fact that I'm yeah. stating. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's a three and out. That's going to happen. Right. right. <laughs> it's going to happen at some point this season. Um, what about the, like, in particular, because I couldn't see where I was. So this mm. is me being selfish as the selfish person who went and sat in the stands in the shade. <laughs> Um, what, like, so why did you feel Miami defensively, their defense backs kind of got the edge against the receivers in those one-on-one In the drills? one-on-ones, they were just there. Like, no one was able to really break away. Okay, so separation. Yeah. It just it didn't seem, like, the, the, Miami was exploding off the line a lot better, it seemed. It feels like that's their game a little bit mm-hmm. more. I know that's where the Falcons are trying to get to mm-hmm. right. with guys like Ray Ray McLeod and Darnell Mooney, but... Like, Drake London is still just, hey, let's go box him out and, and throw it up high, and I'm going to go get it. And he had a couple of yeah. <laughs> those types of catches today. And, and so it is, like, stylistically a little bit different. It was very inspiring to see Atlanta's defensive backs hold up a little bit because I was maybe more worried, I think, about that side of the Same. ball. Um, so there's time, and obviously offenses are very complex and a lot of moving parts. So now is maybe where we do move into that full team um, moving part element to it. And, and Taryn, you touched on already a little bit of Kirk kind of starting slow in the team period, but when did he pick up and what did that look like? Um, he did in like even the second time he was out there, he had two completions then to Bajan and Tyler, but then there were like two skirmishes during that period too. The <laughs> offense was getting frisky. I yeah. think that was the best part to watch. I'm a very, very numbers based person. I get that from my father. Science and math were actually my best classes in high school. So, like, <laughs> your father Pythagoras is that? No, that, that was your dad. No. <laughs> only the, the only one and only Jeffrey Walk. <laughs> much Jeffrey, but so like my notebook would probably looks so different from Tori's in that sense, which is just interesting when we like go over it in this area. Yeah, because by a very like numbers based and just like fact after fact after fact, and. Um, so when I was like looking at the one-on-ones, I was like, okay, I have every single one listed out who won it and leaving it at that, just getting the straight details there. And so then when it came to like team, it was very similar in that way where I have each play written out. But then when it did get to the fights, I was like, okay, let's stick to the details here because I love a good skirmish. I was like, (laughs) Ooh, go. (laughs) And the first one was with Chris Lindstrom, which was a little surprising. Chris, I, and what's funny? What's funny is, is Taryn texted me and she was like, <laughs> "Chris got, uh, Chris got heated in a moment." And I was like, "Yeah, Chris is feisty. I think people think he's such a nice guy, and he would never like." Be- and I remember he's from Massachusetts. Yes. He's also the best guard in the NFL. Yeah. You don't become the best guard in the NFL without, without an having edge, an no. absolute mean streak. To Correct. You. But then it's just like, and then he's a like, sweet teddy bear. Like, <laughs> like that's you true. Know, you can cut in line with me at the cafe. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no, Chris. But, don't. Yeah, he got in a little skirmish after Tyler Algier's run, and then Matthew Bergeron, who's just been picking fights left and right this camp, not yeah. actually picking fights, but definitely standing up for himself. Did so after Bajan Robinson's run in that same one. I mean, Canadians are but. notably just ornery, <laughs> ornery dudes. Like, glad we're as far from you the look right at them the wrong way, be. and they're just like, "Hey, what's going on?" But like, that was just a clear off to on moment, even for Kirk. Not that like the incompletions were necessarily his fault. Again, Jalen Ramsey, but you can see he went from none to completing all of them. So it's like just adjusting as you were saying Tori mm-hmm. I can't like just nod to you and people know what I'm talking about <laughs> you <laughs> but 
you saw it later too. It got it balanced out more later mm-hmm. than there was like the third series out there. And probably the highlight of the day for multiple reasons was Kirk had a really solid pass up the middle to Drake London. Mm-hmm. And then a fight broke out. So like, oh, <laughs> it was a double whammy for me. That one though was because um, it wasn't an O-lineman who started it. I don't know who got hands first, but Drake came in hot because he got hit after the play died. Mm-hmm. It was like a really late hit and it was a hard hit. Mm-hmm. And so then like everyone came running in. Yeah. And then I was like, ooh, and I'm over here like giggling, like <laughs> bouncing back and forth, like go. Meanwhile, I'm on the <laughs> other field watching the defense and everybody's just like, oh, cool. But like, <laughs> isn't it weird seeing like one there's on two fields and one field doesn't even move. They just no. kept doing their stuff. And seeing the amount of people that were actually like all Everyone. running together. I was yeah. like, 180 people is a lot of freaking people. Yeah. Like when you have a 90 man roster can just stay on the field because you got just the ones and the twos mm-hmm. for offense and defense and like 90 other players yeah. are just absolutely Super Smash Brother like over there. <laughs> it's it's interesting to watch. Yeah. It's yeah. it's like a real social My experiment. My favorite part was I just hear Mike McDaniel yelling. <laughs> he wasn't even on our field. He was over by... He was offense. Yeah, yeah, he was over with on this on I the mic. I heard him before I saw him, and then I just see him running and waving like stop. <laughs> like, y'all are stupid. Well, because <laughs> there there was such an interesting thing that Raheem said going back and listening to his his press conference afterwards on the ride back, and I I may ask him some follow ups about this uh, tomorrow, but just him talking about part of the reason they that he loves joint practices is because you can mitigate the injury aspect of it based on the way that you script the practice. Yeah. And so I want to learn a little bit more about like, how do you mitigate the injury? But like, mm-hmm. I'm not shocked then to hear that Mike McDaniel is like, hold the phone. <laughs> what is everybody doing over here? Like cut it out Don't because be children. the whole point is like, Hey, Raheem and Mike have a, a history. Like they, they respect the way that both um, parties go about it. Their teams are, mm-hmm. are like in lockstep. It seems with how they want to conduct these joint practices and a big part of that is getting everybody healthy to the regular season. So, you know, again, you understand why fights break out. And candidly, like when that happened, mm-hmm. everybody in the stands was going nuts. Yeah. Like that was the most excited they got all day. Short of, I, I can, short of Tyreek's. Short, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Short of Tyreek's uh, 40 yard touchdown pass. Yeah. Other oh, we than that. Hear that. Is that when they started chanting dolphins? Yes, it was. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. It, they it, they did also get a random Dolphins chant going at one oh. point just while like the quarterbacks were talking to like Bradley Pinion and Young Way Koo. <laughs> I was like, what are we doing here, guys? I mean, this is so not the right time. <laughs> Read the room. Um, I don't know. I loved it. I just like hearing the fans again. <laughs> yeah, it, me too. It is honest. We miss we miss y'all we at do. Uh, at training camp. But switching from the the starting quarterback to Michael Penix, because Michael I, Penix. I think that he had a really solid uh, day that probably got progressively better as it went along. So what did you see from Michael Penix? Yes. I think we've seen Penix be consistent in his own way. Like, I don't know that he's ever had like a really, really down day or really, really up day. You yeah. know what I mean? I think his game is different than like Kirk Very at different. this point going into year 13. Mm-hmm. You, you're just able to, like as we said on Friday, like the check downs, he just understands mm-hmm. kind of like boom, boom, boom. I think with Penix, like it's still the talent is like his arm is just a howitzer. Mm -hmm. And so with that you do, and it's not that he's like trying to fit the ball into super tight windows or anything. It's more just the, the feel for where the receivers are, where Mm -hmm. the ball needs to go, just missing a little bit and dialing that in. But that's why the Falcons are giving him a runway. Yeah. Um, Before I go to the two points I wanted to hit with Penix, he did have a, like a really nice deep pass to Patero Hodge. And I feel like it was one of those moments where I was like, there's that whip. There's and that's that it. Whip on the ball. That's it right that's there. Why, mm-hmm. That's what differentiates him. It's like, yep. that's why he's here. That mm-hmm. would sting bare hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. Or gloved hands, even. Speaking of which, <laughs> Darnell Mooney, I noticed in like warm up drills the other, like catching with no gloves on. I freaking love really? it. When you get a receiver, yeah. like if I if I was starting right now, I'm going to make my son no no gloves. Like, it <laughs> right just now. sorry. Is it who? Yeah, so no gloves. We're going to just get <laughs> no out in the backyard. Gloves. I'm going to get Michael Penix Jr. to throw him some freaking fastballs. Sling uh, it. Got to train him, but sorry. I might call a child services and do that. <laughs> 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 he, he can't even walk yet, right? He going to learn today. Oh, man. <laughs> but what stood out most to me, I think Penix had a really good time near the goal line, mm. which I thought was interesting. Like just the instincts there were good. 
because he was the one who threw two touchdown passes back to back. He had one to Carlos Washington Jr., who we're going to see a lot of. Mm-hmm. We have seen a lot of. We'll continue to talk about him. Stay tuned. And then he also hit Ross Dwelly, who I've also spoken a fair bit about. Mm-hmm. So, like, those two are really stepping up and capitalizing on their moments. But I think it was just interesting that, like, they were very different plays and Penix still recognized them and was able to do it back to back. So, Tori, we've got one more practice tomorrow. Uh, what are you going into that practice kind of looking for? What's, what's rattling around in the back of your mind? So... We didn't see Braylon Trice out at practice today. Cough, cough. He's sick. He's sick. He is in... A cough, cough wasn't sarcastic. But that was, was just awesome. a mean girl's No quote. pun intended, yeah, but like no pun perfectly intended. pun intended. <laughs> so he is in Miami with us. Yes. It, it did travel down to Miami, but we didn't see him today. And it was interesting because see, without Braylon Trice, you got to see more of Arnold Debichetti, Damone Harris... Bradley, Bradley and I, and I th- these guys who, outside of AK, but uh, Damone and Br- Bradley and I, Bradley. every single time that they were out there, I was like, these two guys are fighting for roster spots. And this week in this, you know, joint practice and every, and then the preseason game, it's those it's those storylines that kind of matter right now. Yep. You know who Grady Jarrett is. You know David Onyemata. Like we we've been talking so much about the inside linebacker rotation, which that's exactly what it is between Caden, Troy, and Nate. But it's those extra pieces of depth that I think is going to be very interesting to see tomorrow, and then once we do get to the preseason game. Um, I, I thought that just from today, I was very, very pleased with what I saw in the red zone from this defensive line. Hmm. This defensive front, I thought, showed up in the red zone in a way that I thought was very promising. I like that you said defensive front. Yes. Too, because mm-hmm. J.D. Very, Bertrand was getting involved mm-hmm. on some blitzes. We know Kate Nellis and Troy Anderson are going to be very involved. Right, yeah. I'm talking about the front seven. You know, like, I'm not – nothing against the guys in the secondary because, obviously, they have to do their job in the coverage. And But when you go into a red zone period and you're backed up probably within 15 yards of the goal line, it's that defensive front that – I thought was the starter, the kickstarter for the entire defense. And it was like every single group that rotated in had a play Mm -hmm. and had a moment. They did not – I said this earlier in the podcast, and I'm going to say it again. They did not make it easy for Tua in the pocket, particularly in the red zone period. And that was something that looking back on the day, that was the biggest takeaway that I had. And it's something that I think could pay dividends for this defense as you go into the preseason and also the regular season as a whole. It was, I don't know, David Onyemata was in the backfield, Grady Jarrett, and then, I mean, even... I even noticed, like, Brandon Dorless. Brandon and, Dorless, yeah. and, we, you know, we talked to Brandon Dorless after practice, and he was talking about that period, and he was like, you know, there's something very intense that comes comes along with that, and it, it also is, we want to be the starters. We want to be the kickstarters. We yeah. want to be the one that start things off on the right note. We want to get a sack in the red zone. And I don't know. I was very pleased with that. But it's just continuing to see that as we move forward, along with these various stories of who could make this roster and and where guys are slotting in. Yeah. I uh, kind of, when I was sitting up in the stands, I just looked at the front and kind of the different combinations. And basically what I've noticed is like five-man fronts Mm -hmm. with Two linebackers, two linebackers, two inside linebackers when you're not in nickel. That's mm-hmm. your base look. Then they've got a combination where it stays a five-man front. You have one linebacker yep. and you bring in your nickel. And then they've got a four-man front with two linebackers and a nickel. Yeah. And primarily those have been their three packages right. that I've noticed. And that is why I say all the time that base defenses, almost to a certain extent, don't matter. Because yeah. nobody was like, they're running a 5-2. Right. No <laughs> one's sitting there being like, oop. Yeah. Like, no. And also just, I, I, I made this note in the camp report, but I was really interested in the way they were using D'Angelo Malone today, almost like a jack, and mm-hmm. with just either Nate Landman or J.D. Bertrand in. I don't know. 
And then you also kind of have this similar look for for Caden Ellis, where yep. he's he's up. And then you have these different blitz packages for Troy Anderson yep. and Caden Ellis. Uh, AJ Terrell came in AJ on the blitz Terrell today and got got, a, got to a, You got D. Alford making a couple plays in there. I mean, I there's a lot of things that you could do with this defense. Jesse Bates, where you at, man? Just make <laughs> one play. Come on. <laughs> They're heavy, heavy sarcasm. Heavy, heavy sarcasm. Uh, oh. But yeah, so that's that's kind of where this defense left me. I, I, I left the practice feeling very good about this defense. Nice. Taryn, what about you? What do you want to see? I feel like, I don't want to say I didn't feel good about the offense leaving. I just feel like reality checked a bit, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. Like, I feel like we've been saying how, and again, not that he was bad, not that he was inconsistent, but it's not like I was over here being like, were there one or two or three incompletions? There were multiple. What a- that is also more realistic. Oh, for so sure. So I feel like... Today was probably a reality check a bit. What about the run game? Because I f- kind of feel like every time I, I glanced over, they, they were running love. the ball a lot. So, like, that, that's an, just another element when we're talking about, like, yeah. the offense. How did they look versus – were they moving the ball on the ground? Or did you notice Miami's kind of front stifling Tyler Algier and Bajan a little? No, they were running it. I okay. have a few notes where it's like, seven, run. Nice. <laughs> nice. I put a little nice. I love <laughs> like, that. Yeah. Actually, is more standout than just a play that will go by unnoticed. So, like, they were able. To, it's not that they weren't moving the ball. I think it's just how coming off of yesterday's practice, which was kind of slower because they were traveling, but specifically that Friday night line when, mm-hmm. night one in Mercedes Benz Stadium, where we were all like, "OMG, yeah, amazing." It's just like it's not that vibe. Mm-hmm. So I think it's not that it was bad. It's not that it was amazing. I think it was just a reality check. Mm-hmm. Away Which games is are different. What you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's the one thing I think about training camp. And you can call me a pessimist. I call myself a realist. <laughs> um, I get that a lot. But it's just keeping that in perspective. Because, I mean, I covered the Saints two years ago, which I know is going to get a lot of booze on this podcast. <laughs> but people there were like, this is the Saints team that's going to win it all. They're great. They're great. They were not great. That is what happens in yeah. every the single preseason. training camp. Yeah, with every single team. Every single team goes into the off season, into the into the training camp, being like, "We are Super Bowl contenders, and this is we're going to the playoffs, and this team is so good." And yeah. then there's always a point of being like, whether it comes the first week of the preseason or the eighth week of the season. Yeah, right. There's always this reality check that even the very best teams that you project to be the very best can lose to anyone at any point in time. Right. Yeah. Because there is this level of parity in the NFL. Houston and Philadelphia. Yeah. Right. Two, so, two teams right there. I last experienced season. it with two teams now. Like, I know that's not that many, but it was just very, like, very similar where people are saying the same thing. Oh, yeah. Like, Y'all, like it's the preseason. It's, you can't you can't put all your eggs in one basket and be like, this is it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've got to give the shout out to our man though, because Pitbull did pick the Dolphins to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> and here and, we are. And by you and you saying our man, we do mean your man. <laughs> Pitbull is my man. <laughs> Not a team man. Yeah, we're but bulldogs like, over everyone's here. Everyone's <laughs> making huge assumptions so soon. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, all teams are good right now. All teams are mm-hmm. great right now. Because how can you not be? There yeah. hasn't been a game. Nobody's lost a game. Yep. Exactly. Everybody. Um, so that's the realist in me being here. Like, all right, I'm back in my comfort zone today because things weren't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you love navigating rocky seas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's I like sometimes you hear players when they've retired or whatever, and they're like, yeah, you know, you know, when you're in training camp and you kind of look around and you're three weeks in, you're like. Ugh. This is not going to be our year. We don't have it. Or you look around and you're like, all right, we got a group. Like, this is going to be, this is going to be nice. Let's, let's get it together. I just have to imagine that somebody like Raheem Morris doing this his entire life, like, I would love to get some truth serum in him and just be like, <laughs> is this have it? you ever, like, three weeks into a training camp just been like, man, can the offseason get here already because this is going to be a, a slog? Or, or do they feel the same way that all of us feel, which is you, you get – like tricked is a strong word, but it's right. just that you're you all you're the Kool-Aid. well. All you're doing is you're going off of what you have mm-hmm. to evaluate, right? And and when you don't have any type of real comparison point or extra data point to like base anything off of, you're just kind of doing what the players are doing over and over again, mm-hmm. which is you learn the tendencies of the other side, you know the strengths and weaknesses, the deficiencies, and you can kind of attack it or whatever. But it all just it's like 
gets muddled together a little yeah. bit. And Today so was the first taste of true comparison mm-hmm. yeah. when it came to two different teams showing what they've got and where they stack up. Uh, Yes, I I think that's really, really well said. So let's go ahead and wrap up today's episode with our camp champ from the first uh, joint practices against the Miami Dolphins. This is probably a a really, really fun camp champ because there was so much competition. Um, So Taryn, let's let's start with you. You're going to hate my explanation. I picked Drake London because his play started a fight. Here's the thing about Drake. I love that explanation. We uh, (laughs) got him in the clear. My thing with Drake is that Drake is such a chill, like very California type of dude. The chillest dude to start fights. But, well, that's the thing. It's like (laughs) off the field. And then on the field, he he does have a switch that flips. And that was the one thing that I think, I can't remember if it was Darnell Mooney or Ray Ray McLeod that was asked about him. And they were like, he has an aggression to him that you don't necessarily see right away until he's between the lines. Mm. And, and I think that, again, going back to the conversation that we were having about Chris Lindstrom and how it's like you have to have – the best players have to have yeah. an edge. Drake London's is slowly but surely coming out more and more. And I think that comes with, like, confidence – in what's being experience. done, experience, and you earn it. Yeah, yes. you earn that edge. Yeah, you earn the right to have it. You have your self confidence, <laughs> but then also the team has confidence in you. Yeah, right. Like so. So yeah, there, there's. I like. I think there definitely is a flip switchers mm-hmm. like banner that we can make for this team. Mm-hmm. Almost like you remember. You ever see the movie Clock Stoppers? Like 2002, yeah. just like the, no. these are the flips. It, it may have been a little bit before your time. It was a Disney Channel, I think, original movie. Yeah. Um, man, I love that movie. But, but it's like we need to basically make that T-shirt or that poster and just call it Flip Switchers and yeah. have like Chris Lindstrom and Drake, Drake uh, London, and I mean Jesse Bates is probably yeah. another good one. Like Caden Ellis is a good. The, this T Grady is like the perfect mm-hmm. example. Jake Matthews. Mm-hmm. So. I, I really like Drake as, as kind Reading of the, the, Falcons. the camp champ. He also had an amazing toe, like, tap. It, kind was of. A, it was a really good catch, too. So I want to pick him as my camp champ because I think he showed a little bit of everything. He showed that he can bounce back from issues because I know there was an incompletion that nearly turned into an interception off of him. But, again, he was able to bounce back and make the plays that mattered. Yeah, it was an incompletion that... What's his name? What's his name? David Long Jr. almost picked off, but it fell. But then he later had that big catch where it's like, you're seeing both sides of the spectrum, and that's what I love. Mm-hmm. I love seeing, like, your highs and lows. Like you were saying with the cornerback, mm-hmm. where you have those big moments of stardom and those lower moments. It's just like, who can balance both? Mm-hmm. Because if you get a bad moment and you just fall to the sand, you're not going to stick around. Mm-hmm. You're not going to last long in this league. Mm-hmm. You ready for my camp champ? I'm so ready. So my camp champ is the um, canned Gatorades at the Miami facility. I didn't drink one. I cannot believe I didn't drink one. I don't know. So people, I'm I don't gonna be know so mad at you if we have to invite a canned Gatorade to the show <laughs> no, on the I'm, last day of training camp and put a crowd on its head. <laughs> I don't think they're gonna win again. They could win tomorrow. The at the facility at the Miami facility, it's my favorite thing. It's why it's the only thing that gets me through these like hot. <laughs> AF, I don't know if I can say that on the podcast. But Atlanta these, Falcons. A, yeah. <laughs> AF social. AF. That's what I think every time, though. <laughs> but, like, I, I love those canned Gatorades. And it's the old logo on the can, which I love, too. But in all actuality, I'm not giving my camp champ to a singular person. I'm giving it to a group. A 12-pack. Mm. I, no. <laughs> oh, I, the Gatorade. I am giving my camp champ to the defensive line. Okay. Oh, that surprises me. I think that they looked really, really good in spurts today to the point of I'm giving this to them solely based on what I saw from in, them in the red zone. Truly. Yeah. I thought that was – I know I wrote about it after practice ended as like that was the best thing that I saw. And granted, I didn't watch the offense today. I only watched the defense. But I have to give credit where credit is due where they turned it on – same thing that we're talking about with Drake London, with you know Clark Phillips, like they turned it on in the red zone when it really mattered, and that's why they're my camp champs for today. Yeah, and I noticed you only mentioned the defensive line and not the defensive front. So yeah, linebackers, safeties, corners, you guys got to get involved a little bit more, I guess, to earn the camp champ. Um, but I, I really like that because the defensive line was was 
really solid today. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's important. I know the Dolphins like have been retooling their offensive line a little bit, so it's it's not like they're going up against the Lions or, or the Cowboys from like their heyday, but still, everything matters, and the defensive front looked really good. Um, I'm going to go with Clark Phillips yeah, that as, was... my, as my camp champ. Mm-hmm. I kind of feel like he's an obvious answer for today because mm-hmm. he, he just looked really solid, and, and that was something actually that um, you know, I was talking to West Durham about on Monday, just in kind of anticipation for this trip down here and like, all right, what, what should we keep an eye on? And it was kind of like who outside of Tyreek Hill, like doesn't have a, a big day for Miami. Like, cause we know that Tyreek's going to get his, but just see how the other corners and receivers also, and like everybody Clark was up against that. I was kind of watching. He did a really, really good job against a tough, skill group. Yeah. Um, so I, I continue to think that as a second year player in a new scheme, like that's a tough transition, but he is finding ways to still make plays. Like he has more interceptions, I think, than anybody in camp so far, right? Probably. So yeah. it, he's the only one that I think has two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, well, yeah, no. Yeah. So it, it's like he's, he is sticking around and I wouldn't be shocked, even though Mike Hughes has continued to run with the ones Again, I think that that's kind of the veteran part that he's bringing. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if Clark continues to eat into that a little bit. My thing with Clark is I remember this time last year feeling like Clark Phillips was having a really, really good camp mm. in his rookie year. Yeah. I remember talking about Clark Phillips constantly because I loved watching him play. He's someone who's undersized. That is a fact. And But the way he plays, he plays so much bigger than his size. And... That is something that I've never worried about Clark Phillips' intensity level. I've never worried about Clark Phillips like not being around the ball. Mm-hmm. There are very few times that he's just not stuck on his guy. And when he's not stuck on his guy, you take notice of it because it's not something that happens very often. I really like watching him play. Mm-hmm. And call it like chip on your shoulder, call it underdog, call it undersized, whatever. I love it when a guy who doesn't fit the norm of what a position is or what a build, a strength build is succeeds because yeah. they, they compensate for it in other ways. And the way that Clark Phillips compensates for it is he's never going to let his guy breathe. And that's something that I really, really like seeing from him. So I, I will tag on to your vote of Clark Phillips, the third. Oh. I too will flip because I know one of the biggest things, as soon as I picked offense, when Tori and I were like, who's going to take offense, who's going to take defense, I got to the offense and I was like, wait, I was really (laughs) curious about how the Dolphins receivers were going to stack up against the Falcons secondary. And so hearing that he had an interception, that he got a nod, that the entire unit got a nod, I'll switch to. I think your time will come. I've said that about everyone I voted for. I don't think their time will come. Here's the thing, Taryn. Don't worry, because tomorrow we're going to flip, and you can be with the defense, and I'll be with the offense. Cool. Wouldn't it be funny, though, if... <laughs> if the offense goes out, <laughs> right. absolutely, just torches it. <laughs> but that, that'll make I Taryn happy, because she'll, <laughs> she'll get to talk about more uh, disgruntlement, oh, yeah. more realism. Yeah. Um, perception it. versus reality, to quote Kirk Cousins. I love that. Yeah. Why did I, he say that? He said it last week. He calls me first thing every morning and, and tells that, that to me. Mm, that's my wake that up call. That and content, content, content. <laughs> I can think of other ways I'd like to wake up. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and put this podcast to bed. Speaking of all the waking up, um, congratulations to Clark Phillips. He is second. the first two time camp champ. So we have a leader in the clubhouse. Wow. As a reminder, when training camp officially wraps up, we will try to get whoever has been selected our camp champ onto the podcast with us to explain to them what the heck we have been doing over the last three <laughs> weeks that nobody is, I think, aware of in the locker room, but we'll give them some type of, of prize TBD. And yeah, it'll be fun. Um, so Clark Phillips is currently the leader for that, but who knows? Maybe Drake London makes a hard push. Maybe Kirk Cousins, he'll get his second one. Well, um, we're halfway through, so yeah, there's still a lot of, a lot of camp days remaining. Yep. Seven practices left. Taryn has that memorized. <laughs> right, yeah. She is counting She's, down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get out of here. That will do it for today's episode of Falcons Final Whistle presented by Zaxby's. We will see you guys again for our next 
joint practice against Miami, which will take place on Wednesday. But please like and subscribe, share this podcast with anybody who is a Falcons fan in your family or immediate vicinity. And please check us out on YouTube. Uh, This one will not be on camera because, again, we're in Miami, currently sitting in a hotel conference room. Um, But we are putting everything on YouTube. You can also go to AtlantaFalcons.com to check that out. So please spread the word. We can't do this without you, um, but we certainly appreciate you all listening. So for Tori McElhaney and Taryn Walk, I'm Will McFadden. We'll see you guys tomorrow.